Moscow held its municipal elections last weekend, and the event received an unusual amount of attention from the world's media. There seems to be an unprecedented level of public criticism of Putin, but it's coming from the local level and not from Parliament, the Duma. More than 40 local elected officials across Russia signed a two-sentence petition that ended with the statement, we demand the resignation of Vladimir Putin from the post of president of the Russian Federation. Today, I'm exploring these local election representatives, who they are and what risks they're taking by speaking out. Nina Zakharina Birishna is a political expert and researcher with a focus on Russian domestic policy, international advocacy and human rights. She is a board member of the EU-Russia Civil Society Forum and co-founding director of the podcast Civium. She has previously been an advisory council member for rights in Russia and a researcher for the Human Rights Center Memorial. Nina, welcome to the channel. Hi, thanks a lot for having me today. <laughs> and did I get all of your roles correct? Is that all? In yeah, the... yeah, that's, that's all correct. That's all correct. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's start by exploring the various roles and activities uh, that you've done uh, within uh, EU Russia Civil Society Forum, Civium Memorial, the focus is on civic rights, but you've been doing an awful lot around election monitoring as well, haven't you? Yeah, that's correct, because uh, basically uh, starting from 2017, uh, in well, in the elections of 2017, uh, Moscow uh, got 267 independent municipal deputies, and that played a major role uh, on all sorts of uh, levels in in human rights, uh, in ecolo ecological movement, uh, in uh, women's rights, etc. Because actually, uh, people who who were elected as municipal deputies they came into politics uh, in the local politics because some of them couldn't move further up, uh, like Ilya Yashin, who you mentioned earlier, like Konstantin Yinkauskas, so people who were blocked from, from, from going to the Moscow Duma, Moscow Parliament, or, uh, or the State Parliament. Um, so they decided to build their political career in the on the local level. The others who were just activists, uh, they kind of started replacing uh, the traditional institutions and NGOs that started, you know, that started being uh, either dissolved or they 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 had to, you know, leave Russia because of all the foreign agent laws. So those people who were elected independent deputies, they actually took on uh, those roles, uh, being in active and constant communication with the citizens as well. So they knew on the local level what was going on. They could respond uh, straight away to the demand and they really tried to protect their rights. Uh, for instance, after some of the demonstrations where a lot of people were, were detained, they would go to the police, uh, police um, uh, offices, uh, they were allowed in back in the time. Now, obviously, that's changed because now it's them who are detained and arrested. Um, so uh, I think it played a huge role. Uh, I myself was involved a lot and I organized, I used to organize um, before COVID, I used to organize a school uh, in France for local deputies uh, to meet their colleagues here in France. So that's how I met a lot of them uh, in Moscow and I stayed in touch with them. I I think uh, election monitoring is extremely important in Russia because, well, it's uh, since 2011 uh, that uh, the, the falsifications became obvious uh, and as, as many observers as possible are needed in place. Uh, that's why it, from starting from 2013, I observed a lot of elections, once even in Dagestan, in a remote village, uh, which was an extremely interesting experience. Um, so yeah, uh, this time, especially, you know, after February 24th, when Russia is practically cut out from the world, isolated, uh, there's no information, there's not much information coming out of Russia. I thought it would be very important to go there myself and witness what's going on, especially because before February 24th, I practically spent, well, six months a year there, mm. uh, going back and forth between Paris and Moscow. 
I mean, it's an extraordinary trying to be traveling to Moscow. And as you say, it's not just that there aren't many NGOs anymore. I mean, there's practically none. Um, but also there are very few business people and even journalists. Many uh, publications are no longer basing their journalists in Moscow, but they're reporting on Russian events mm -hmm. from Kiev and other places, which is a complete reversal of how it used to be. Yeah, that's correct. Well, basically, most of the independent medias uh, were forced to leave Russia because they were blocked or they were uh, declared extremists and, and therefore blocked as well. So uh, it posed the real risks for, for independent journalists to stay in Russia because they would just end up in, in prison. So most of them moved to Vilnius and Riga, and they're now reporting from there, which I think is a shame because, well, you can't really report on what's, what's going on on the ground if you're not on the ground. And I've spoken with some of the journalists who had to leave because they wanted to avoid the prison term, obviously, and they are not happy about it because they say, well, we're Russian journalists. We, we love our profession. We want to be in Russia to report on what's going on in Russia because it's more important than ever at the moment. Um, however, uh, there's one, um, uh, there's a website that's called Taki Dila, which translates as um, uh, those affairs, these affairs, and it's all based on what's going on on the ground, on the social um, cases, uh, on, I don't know, like poverty or uh, orphanages or old house people or old people's houses etc uh, so it's actually it's all the stories from uh, from how ordinary people have been uh, lied to by the government basically mm. and they have stayed in in Russia and the editor-in-chief she told me that well it was obvious for her that well maybe one day she would also end up in prison and that that's not exactly her dream, <laughs> uh, but if she leaves, then those people have no hope at all because those people are not well connected. Those just the uh, people from the regions, they're poor, they don't have much, they don't have any connections. Uh, so somebody has to, you know, travel, the journalists have to travel to the regions to, to, find, to find those cases, to speak to those people, to make them, to make their voices heard. Uh, and that if that disappears, then, you know, people just don't have any hope at all. Mm. And this is a really interesting point, isn't it? Because, um, you know, a lot of the political crackdown is in relation to foreign policy. It's in relation to people who are criticizing the war or even using the word war. And yet there's this whole layer of people who are agitating locally for things like better roads, hospitals, and they're directing a lot of their anger and frustration at local politicians. Now, are they just overlooked by the Kremlin because they don't see as that as important? Or is it a mechanism where it allows some of this frustration to be you know, expended at a local level because it doesn't threaten the center. So is this a conscious decision to let that carry on or or is it just passing under the radar? You know what, I think uh, it's an excellent question. I think a lot of it is actually used uh, by, by the authorities uh, to kind of take the attention from something more important. So uh, it is... Um, it is being overlooked. Uh, the the power in uh, in Russia is very centralized, uh, but then they try to give, they try to kind of pretend to give some responsibility to the regional, uh, regional uh, mayors or or just well elected people. Um, but in fact, uh, I think that's what plays the key role because uh, going back to your question, we always focus on geopolitics, on kind of scandals, you know, uh, be it the war in Syria, Ukraine, annexation of Crimea. And that is, of course, extremely important. But uh, we have to realize that Russia is a country that has no institutions. Uh, and when it comes to roads, education, uh, healthcare, um fair fair trials you know fair elections it just doesn't exist it doesn't exist because there's no uh institution institutions and they can only be built inside the country so it's actually extremely important to focus on mm. those questions in order to 
build the institutions because there will be a window of opportunity. There was already a window of opportunity 30 years ago. We thought it would last. It yeah. didn't last as long. So we kind of missed it, I think. Um, uh, but this time it will it will happen again, especially with the news of the mobilization that you, you couldn't have missed. I think you saw it. I, I haven't read it in detail, but that came out this morning, didn't it? Uh... Yes, it did. It did. Putin, Putin announced the mobilization um you know things things will be moving and um the invasion of ukraine is just the it's a result of what's going on in russia if we uh connected to the chechen wars to the human rights violations inside russia it's something that has been happening in russia for years and years and years and has been ignored by most of the world saying well it's your problem it's a domestic problem you just deal with it the way you 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 want but it doesn't really work like this because you know the, the monster can't just stay inside at some point it just gets too big and it pulls out and that's what happened with ukraine and and it didn't happen on the 24th of February. It happened uh, on the 18th, March, uh, uh, March 18th, uh, 2014. With 2014, the exactly, yeah. Eight with years the Crimea, ago, yeah. yeah. So, and then it, it kind of, well, yeah, they annexed Crimea, but, well, they still have to deal with their problems themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And um, whatever, uh, whatever horrid war crimes have happened in Bucha or in Izum, uh it has been happening in russia every day in distant villages in prisons mm. with tortures uh with political murders uh with uh, with the violation of, of women's rights it really does happen every day and then it just poured out and mm. you know put out our neighboring country and not even political i mean many of these will be uh local conflicts between say oligarchs between business people between uh it could be mafia it could even be politicians but these are local scores that are being settled aren't they and people being imprisoned unjustifiably as you say day in day out all over the place and none of none of this uh the, the basic level of of lack of clarity or lack of uh, probity in the legal system hasn't received really any attention from foreign media. No, absolutely, because, well, it's a local conflict, but it's so based on corruption. Mm. Uh, and also it's based on statistics. Um, uh, basically, uh, in the police, uh, you need to have a certain number of cases that you've solved in the last month. So mm. if you don't have enough, you just go and you you try to, you know, put some drug crime on, I don't know, on some 18-year-old kids. Uh, and then you beat them up, so that's torture, mm. and then they say, yes, it was us, because then torture becomes unbearable, mm. and that's it. Uh, it's solved, you've solved another case, you get your medal, you get your promotion, and you have enough cases in one month. Uh, and sadly, yeah, not many people know about it. Um, so it's think... not just an authoritarian regime, we're talking about an entire bureaucratic authoritarianism it, it's you know again the media focuses on one person focuses on putin they even fixate on the idea that if putin's deposed everything's going to be wonderful i'm not sure everyone really believes that but perhaps they don't look down at the fact that it's an entire system an entire edifice and just replacing the guy at the top is not necessarily going to fix any of that bureaucratic structure no, there's a thing. Um, I think it's about mentality. It's about education. It's about the flow of information, pluralism, mm -hmm. institutions again. Uh, and it's obvious that even if Putin goes tomorrow, <clears throat> not much is going to change. And if anything, it might even be worse because mm -hmm. there's going to be, you know, this um, uh, fight of elites of who who takes over the power. Um, there might there might even be more repressions. There will be a proper military regime for years after that. So I'm not saying that Putin should stay. I mm. I am not a, a fan of him, obviously, but I mean it is not so basic. It's a lot more complex than that, and that is why I think uh, you know this visa ban that was recently passed by the EU. I think it's very counterproductive because we are. It's, it's only 20% of Russian population who even have 
um, passports to travel with, uh, then those who do, they usually go to uh, to beaches, you know, to Turkey or to go to Turkey, and you know that's not going to stop, is it? So that doesn't really no, that's not going to stop exactly. Uh, those who came to Europe, uh, well, we agree obviously that there were a lot of uh, some rich people who who used to come to France for shopping mm. for Côte d'Azur, um, but actually those they can be listed. Uh, that's what Navalny suggested. They can yeah. just yeah. Uh, the rest, they would go to see their friends, they would go for seminars, mm -hmm. um, they would go to see the culture, the exhibitions, the theatres. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important. And well, now I've just been to Russia, uh, I've spoken to local activists and they are horrified because they're saying, well, we're just cut off from the world. Mm -hmm. And it is really counterproductive because what will it bring uh, if you just isolate such a big country? I mean, even on the EU level, I think it's much better to have a predictable neighbor, mm. uh, especially if the neighbor is so dangerous. Uh, now, <laughs> they, you know, by isolating the neighbor, you, they have no idea what's going on inside, so they can't control it. And even if they were going to limit tourist visas, then they should perhaps in parallel increase the number of academic visas. Uh, they should distinguish between who is the person asking? They should also perhaps make it easier to seek asylum because one of the other things that I've heard people say is that you can't just seek asylum, political asylum, when you're in Russia. You have to leave the country. And the only way to do that is a tourist visa. Then you can potentially exactly. seek asylum. Exactly. So if they're going to close one route off, then there has to be some nuance to open up other routes for people to come out and and that makes it even more dangerous too because then it puts a label like if you're granted a visa then it's obvious that you're an activist yeah. and then it's easy you know uh if only activists or well their position figures if it's only them who are granted visas it well, that, means that, that it's only them label yes exactly yeah. so so it's easy to stop them at the airport and just yeah. you know never let them leave put them in prison straight away Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and then, you know, they say, oh, with the, the, the activists and journalists will still be granted visas. But does it say on your forehead that you're an activist? Obviously not. How are you to prove it? Do you need to bring a CV to the consulate or well, it's impossible? And, and then, you know, like some people need visas urgently because they really need to leave the country. Now, um, uh, I think it's... Um, well, it used to be one week or something. Now I think it's up to, well, it's several months. Uh, you can wait for several months for a visa. And the price also has increased. So mm. it's just not affordable for a lot of people. I mean, this is what it was like in the 90s. I mean, I, I remember helping people to, to get visas in the 90s. And it was incredibly difficult. It was incredibly expensive compared to earnings at the time. And we, we've, we've gone back 30 years, basically. I'd like to ask you two things that really emerge from, from what you've said, and I think they're really fascinating. One is you talked about the level of communication and that sort of interaction between the local deputies, some of them, and their Western counterparts, you know, fact finding, learning. Is there a big difference in how that happens at the municipal level compared to the state level and the Duma? Uh... Well, on the municipal, you mean in Russia, right? In Russia, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that only... contact with foreigners seems to be quite important, you were saying, with some deputies at the municipal level. Well, on the municipal level, there's not much you can do. And then it differs from, from city to city, from region to region. Because, for instance, in St. Petersburg, you have a bigger budget. Mm. In Moscow, you really don't have a lot of budget to do whatever you want. But then it was quite symbolic because i think when you get elected it means that you are you are real a real representative of people people trusted you they voted for you uh so you know if you make a petition that like the one that you mentioned it means that you are representing uh some people people mm -hmm. who are now sitting in 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 the russian duma well <laughs> there's not an opposition party in there it's all people supporting the regime so i don't think they represent anything uh those are the people who obviously uh, make uh introduce uh, all the laws 
uh, in Russia. So it is completely different. It's completely different from what people uh, can do, uh, why they are there, because, you know, even now on the municipal, for the municipal elections that uh, just took place now earlier this month, Mm, there were a lot of candidates. Uh, there was the United Russia candidates. However, uh, a lot of well, now it has this uh, not not the greatest reputation. So, um, and the ruling party obviously understands it. So, it tried to uh, introduce some candidates who pretended not to be a part of it. So they uh, pretended to be independent. Uh, but they're not really interested in doing anything. You know, they're just there because they're put there from above because they're the, uh, you know, they're the the, the puppets, the marionettes. Mm. Uh, and can people it, tell that? Can people tell them apart? I mean, Ilya Yashin is maybe not someone who everybody in the West knows, but he's probably one of the most high profile politicians next to Navalny. Here. And he was recently uh, imprisoned and he was extremely active at the local level, uh, wasn't he? And he had a YouTube channel, which got millions of views. He was extremely prominent. Uh, that's true. Well, basically, I think Ilya Yashin is not really a local politician. He he has the ambition to be the state politician. Well, national, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, but he he wasn't. Uh, he was banned, you know, from going further up, especially after Boris Nemtsov was shot and mm -hmm. murdered. Um, it became a lot more difficult for Yashin. He uh, he stayed very active so I think yeah the only way for him to to go was to to get elected on the local level mm. obviously he was extremely um, active but he his ambition was not really local politics but rather um, you know um, national mm. politics uh, so he was just using uh, his status uh, his mandate uh, as a platform uh, to reach to to reach out to even more people but could that be a model for the future? Because clearly, you know, he would have had to have some connection with his constituents. He would have had to have contact with local activists to get elected. So he has perhaps is more in touch, perhaps, with people and their genuine concerns, whereas politicians in the Duma, as you say, have very little connection with the people, much more connection with local governors, big wigs and the Kremlin's, you know, uh, political objectives is perhaps a model for the future to have Russian politicians really coming from the bottom up and not from the top down. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I've spoken with some of the Ukrainian colleagues that told me that this uh, decentralized model in Ukraine worked really, really well as well. And it does work like that because, you know, uh, you elect somebody who you can go to and directly ask the question that bothers you. Um, the local uh, independent candidates, those were the ones who who went from door to door. They spoke with, you know, with the um, citizens of the districts. They, they discussed the problems. They asked the questions. Uh, so they were in constant connection um to them the the other candidates that you know the fake candidates uh, uh, presented by the um, by the authorities by the the united russia party etc they never did that it was mm. it's just they just sit there and they get the false uh falsified result results and that's how they're elected and also it's very important that you know you've probably heard of the three-day voting that was introduced uh uh, for the um, uh, new constitution referendum in July 2020. Um, so that allows a lot of falsification uh, going together with the electronic voting that was recently introduced as well, because it actually showed, so the election this time, it was uh, it took place on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September. Um, the 9th was Friday. Uh, so on Friday, Friday morning, um, that was the unprecedented number of electronic votes, which means that basically people, well, people are at work, uh, they are forced by their bosses to vote for, for whoever the bosses uh, tell them to vote for. Mm. That's how it works. And then again, the bosses, it's not probably not their initiatives, but they are told from the above as well to, to do so and then they actually have to show a, a report or they have to actually uh, show some photos uh, proving mm. uh, that their employees 
have voted for the right candidate, the right candidate. And we know we know how this works, don't we? Because this actually is is not new. This is how uh, the mafia operated in the 90s in Russia. If you don't go along with this, bad things happen. You won't necessarily get arrested, but your 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 license to trade might be questioned. Mm. You might get a visit from the fire department who shut down some of your offices because you're not in compliance with fire regulations. <laughs> there are all sorts of little mechanisms by which they can pressure people so the idea there's an independent business the independent thinkers yeah. in russia that don't have some kind of coercion from the state i mean that's just fantasy isn't it everybody is to an extent part of that uh system but then you do have a choice for instance there was a case recently of one independent candidate she was uh she uh worked at sberbank uh on a high position and she decided to to go and present herself at the elections and she got told to choose she said she well no she actually didn't get told uh, to choose she just said uh, she just got told that she needs to remove her candidacy and that's it and she said no yeah. i would rather quit my job but well yeah uh, that's it yeah. there's a choice but you work in the system or you have to almost leave the system, leave absolutely. that patronage. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And well, uh, you have probably heard of Yulia Galamina. She's, uh, yeah, she's also, she was a deputy, a local deputy in Moscow. Uh, and then uh, she, uh, basically she lost her mandate because she was uh, charged and she avoided the prison term. Um, but uh, still she lost her mandate. So because she was somebody very prominent, very, you know, bright, active, uh, noticeable, she also used to be a professor at the university. So she got yes. stripped of that as well. Yes. Um, that's what they do, you know, students, uh, uh, students uh, uh, get kicked out of universities, people lose their jobs uh, mm -hmm. because they vote for the wrong candidates uh, yes. or, even not even vote they express their desire to vote for the wrong candidate or you know they um they post something uh on their social media uh in support of navalny or whoever uh and that's it it's just like that now and that happened in february didn't it i mean you don't even have to be white collar or or from an academic background there were people who were losing their jobs from being train drivers in the Moscow metro because they just retweeted or reposted some kind of uh, statement. Uh, political. Absolutely, yeah, and and that's obscene. Or people who just go uh, go out in the street. Well, that that doesn't happen anymore in Russia for obvious reasons. But before, people who used to go out in the streets. Um, they would then get fired or for retweeting or reposting as well. Um, and actually some of the local candidates uh, who were already deputies for the past uh, five years, um, they got stripped of their registration uh, because uh, the registration committee uh, found some old posts on their social, in their social networks about Navalny, who is now an extremist, you know, mm. it's obscene. What, what was done just to stop people, uh, independent candidates from running. Now, we know that the state level elections and for the Duma are clearly rigged. And there are many, many ways in which uh, that happens. Some are really overt and, and obvious. Some are perhaps a little more subtle. Do they, however, do they bother to rig the local elections too? Or are they less concerned about that process? Oh, they absolutely do. I think, you know, what happened in 2017, that was very unexpected. And like I said, 267 independent candidates got elected. Uh, that's a lot on the Moscow level, real people representatives. Uh, so this time they really made sure that uh, all the well-known, famous uh, local politicians, they just either didn't get uh, their registration at all or they got stripped of, uh, of it. Um, there were other techniques like introducing um, uh, people with the same surname, for example. Um, uh, then uh, there were candidates that were related to the Moscow City Hall, but they went as independent. 
Um, then uh, almost all of the publications, uh, leaflets, they were removed of, of all the independent candidates. They were removed from houses. Um, and yeah, and then this electronic voting, for example, in one Moscow district, uh, in one polling station, uh, they stayed until the morning to count the ballots. Um, after the result of the electronic voting, after the rest of the polling station of the district, and one opposition candidate, he came uh, first or second in most of the uh, of the polling stations, and then they saw that he was about to win. So they put him, and they rigged that obviously, mm. ninth in that uh, last polling station, and that played, you know, the the major role and he uh, and just because of that he didn't pass so in the end we are with 10 independent candidates this time against the uh, 267 in 2017 only 10 but really i guess uh really strong ones because even the machines as in electronic voting couldn't do anything against them and another way it's conversed. So you've got the sort of corruption, manipulation of the actual result. But even prior to that, during the campaign, it's true to say that the state media doesn't really give any attention to opposition candidates or voices unless they're looking to you know, mock them or, or take them down. Um, but at the municipal level, is there any kind of media coverage at all of the you know unofficial activity or unofficial candidates? No, only only independent media, which all is blocked in Russia. So no, uh, there's no access to media, and even you know uh, really well known people like uh, uh, like Lea Yashin or Konstantin Yinkauskas, they don't get any media coverage. I don't. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't think there was anything in the media about in the official media uh, about Yashin's arrest. Uh, there was another municipal deputy, and he was from Lea Yashin. Uh, um, local council Alexei Gorinov who actually got seven uh, years of uh, of prison term for just saying calling uh, the war war <laughs> uh, and that is something well it's it's horrifying but I don't think it was covered in the in the state media I don't think many people know about it because to be honest uh, speaking of people who support this you know the special operation the invasion uh, there's, I would say there's 20% of people who actively strongly support it. There's 20% of people of the population who are actively against it. And the rest, they just don't have enough information. And, uh, you know, with the um, independent media blocked and just with the lack of information, if you don't know what to look for, how can you, you can't look for it just because you don't know those names. And uh, I've spoken with the independent candidates who went door to door to speak with the with the citizens and they told me that almost none of them were supportive of the current regime of the politics of the current regime of the invasion of ukraine they were all horrified but then people are scared to speak out or they just don't have enough information or they're looking to somebody for somebody to discuss it with but again they might be scared they don't know who to talk about they don't want to break uh, their families etc um, and this is the Belarus strategy, isn't it? Because there the protests did reach a critical tipping point. And I think, you know, the Kremlin was extremely worried by that. Yeah. And one of the tactics they used was not to say to people, Lukashenko's wonderful or, you know, you, you, you've got you got it completely wrong to oppose it. Quite the opposite. They were like, well, we know Lukashenko is an awful person. We know this is a dreadful regime. What they tried to do is convince people that they were isolated, that there were far fewer of them and that they had no chance of winning. So, again, this sort of segment of people you're talking about, they might be aware of information. They might have enough information to actually come to conclusion that, you know, the war is wrong, etc. But they don't know who else shares that point of view. They don't know how to organize and they don't know how to turn their point of view uh into into an action of any sort yes absolutely i i completely agree and then actually you know what the what the western 
uh, visa ban did, it actually really played along with the regime because people are now feel feeling isolated by both sides. They kind of attack, they're attacked by the government. They're scared to speak out, but they were hoping, you know, that Europe with its European values, with its history, it would always be supportive. Mm. And now it's not. So they don't have anywhere to turn. And I know for a fact that some people are critical of this decision. Some people are very disappointed by Europe because they're, you know, they're kind of, they're locked in Russia. And a lot of people, they can't leave, you know, this, um, uh, this, uh, all this talk about um and all the all the good people uh, have left, and those who stay, they they all uh, support the regime. That mm. is completely not true, not true because a lot of uh, people are staying because they're activists, because they think correctly that they can only fix anything from inside of the country. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just can't leave because they have, I don't know, uh, old sick parents mm. or uh, for whatever reason, and you cannot criticize them, but they're against the regime, they're against the invasion. Um, and they have nowhere to turn, they have no no one to speak to. So if you just isolate the country, they will they have no other choice left rather than, you know, kind of stay in their own circle and the circle is becoming smaller and smaller. And in the end, uh, they're left out of the, you know, all the progress. Uh, so we don't know how their opinions will will change, actually. It's difficult, isn't it? Because uh, if you compare that to the evolution of Ukraine, it has had a lot of uh I call it bumps in the road. You know, they've had advances and retreats and they've had lots of issues, Mm. multiple revolutions and demonstrations. And of course, the Kremlin's used that to say, well, do you want this? You know, do you want that level of chaos, et cetera, et cetera? Mm. But actually, when you speak to Ukrainians, I think they have a strong understanding that it's these continuous upheavals that have helped to actually create civil society. Each time it happens, it boosts awareness and it boosts activism amongst the critical younger generation. It gets people involved, even if the result is not ideal and it's messy, and perhaps economically it's not that efficient. In the long run, it's helped to create a a very vibrant civil society and an Mm -hmm. awareness of how important that is. This is totally lacking, isn't it, in, in Russia? And when people say, oh, the West could do more, or Europe could do more, they're perhaps missing the fundamental point of how Ukraine has achieved this. They've achieved it internally by taking responsibility themselves. And yes. maybe it's only 10, 15 percent of the population. It's still a small minority that are really active. But in some ways, you can't impose this kind of grassroots democracy on a country. It has to come from within, doesn't it? I completely agree with you. But I think Russia is so much bigger than Ukraine mm. and it is might actually be be a problem because people well in 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 my opinion i think um historically if you look at the soviet times uh people were kind of forced uh, to to stop analyzing uh, they got told that you you should only be interested by your local but by your you know domestic affairs what's mm-hmm. going on in your family in your courtyard and not don't even look um, at your neighbors you know just like uh, stay away from from everything else so from the soviet times that kind of attitude it stayed uh through the 90s um and even with the opportunity to travel and to study uh, for some people, it was really difficult to get a visa because you know you need to uh, you need to have a bank account uh, with like a lot of money on it. Mm. If you live in a distant village, you there's only few, very few cities in in Russia. Russia is huge where you can go to get your visa to apply for it. So uh, I think actually it might have been a mistake to uh, impose such strict rules to get student visas for example mm, and the, yeah. argue, the common argument is that well you know if you're a student you just go to europe and you stay there but it's not true i know people who have returned i myself live between two countries so people do try and you know whatever values whatever they learn uh in the west they try and and go and and spread it around as many people as they know because i think that's how it works step by step you know 
you can't expect a change immediately. You can't expect yeah. tomorrow. You can't expect people to just all change at once. But it is based on information flow, on the openness. Uh, and now it is uh, counterproductive. And with Ukraine, they did achieve a lot. But the West kind of opened its doors to Ukraine. Absolutely, absolutely. And many of the people, and this is what really strikes me, and this perhaps is 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 how we need to go with Russia in future. Many, many people I've spoken to, whether they're politicians or journalists or activists, you see in their CVs, and they might have studied at university in Ukraine, but then they've done courses in the West. Uh, they've done PhDs. They've gone on. They perhaps worked for a period. There's this extraordinary mixture of local and I would call it almost international uh, experience within their CVs. And we're talking about a handful of people here. There are thousands, if not tens of thousands of people uh, in Ukraine who've lived and worked abroad, gone back. And as you say, have a foot in both camps, yeah. they can see what it's like, which helps them see through the propaganda and it helps them yeah, behave differently. Well, exactly. That's what I think. And I think it is just difficult to reach out to all the people in, in Russia. And, you know, even when we speak of the uh, annexed Crimea, uh, I really disagree with this politics of, uh, you know, school certificates not being recognized in Europe, uh, mm. Crimean, because children, they don't have any choice. They stayed there because their parents stayed there. They couldn't leave. They had to finish their schools, but then maybe they want to go and study elsewhere. And they are just, they just don't have this opportunity. And there's, you know, uh, the West chose to kind of ignore what was happening in Crimea because mm. it's uh, unrecognized territory, but there's tremendous human rights violations. Yeah. And a lot of human rights defenders went there and it doesn't mean to say that they accept that uh, Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, obviously not, but somebody has to monitor whatever is going on and to monitor it, you can't do it from the outside. You really have to be inside. And that's exactly what's going on in Russia at the moment. You, to, to realize what's happening, Russia is this iceberg. The rest of it is the top of it, is a result of what's going on under, you know, under the water, under the ground. So you, I might, you have to be inside to, to yeah. know it. And my concluding question, really, because I know um, I know we're almost out of time. This is such a huge, huge problem, and Russia is so vast. But if we break it down into perhaps something more manageable, could it be that the renewal of Russia and getting on a path to political evolution rather than the sort of stagnation we see at the moment? Could that renewal come from the local level, the municipal level, uh, much more than the top? I think absolutely. But again, the problem is that uh, at least in Moscow, there's, we only we only have uh, 10 independent deputies now. Um, I think, I think uh, it all comes from people always because it's the people who, who see what the problem is. Um, uh it doesn't matter what it is uh organized crime corruption uh uh some environmental problems it's the people and even though a lot of people have left the problems have stayed mm -hmm. <laughs> so there will be new activists and people just can't leave um they can ignore things uh i um it's, it's a very interesting case actually i did some research on ecological activism uh it, people try to distance themselves from politics they say well we just want to save our park but mm. generally we support the regime we don't care about what's going on we don't even go and vote or we we vote for whoever our employer tells us to vote for uh, but we just want to save our park so mm. they at the start there is no this logical uh, connection it's missing that it is actually because of the regime that you vote for mm. that you are going to miss your park there's going to be cut down and there's going to be i don't know some construction work but when they start being active uh, yeah. they see how it works because then they start getting attacked by the police there's going to be bribes there's going to be beatings up and then through that for example um in the past few years there's been a lot of local uh deputies that emerged from just this you know being completely politically passive mm. so i think I think you just need time, really give people time. 
I know that you say, well, not you, but people say, well, you know, there's been 30 years. What have you done? What have you achieved? Look at where we are now. That's true. Um, but I think you do need to give support in openness, in the information flow, uh, with visas to all those local activists, because the power now is not in the big names. Uh, it's not the big names that will bring the big change. It now is the smaller names that will bring the bigger change. It's all in horizontal activism and in, in grassroots links and initiatives. And we have to hope that things will get better, that the war ends and Russia can start that evolutionary process towards a more egalitarian and representative political system. And I think we're going to have to end there, but um, I think there is so much more to, to talk about potentially. Um, and I'm really grateful, Nina, for you to spend the time. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your interest. I think it's very important, all the questions that you've asked. And I hope to speak to you soon. Thanks a lot.